So hi guys, uh, you can see I'm um, in my bed, uh, but today is part two of Blitchy Park, and the reason why we didn't finish it off that day, it, it was a big massive museum, and we were like, we want to come back, and we're finishing it off today. So, what we're going to do is we're going to do the big house and the other parts today. So, it's going to basically be a two-parter uh, Bletchley part. But I'm going to try to see if I can put it into one whole video. So, I'll see you when I get to Bletchley Park.
during World War II. A bomber aircraft is a straight line, from instruction to target. A soldier in the field, a naval ship, is a dot on the waves, a dot or a dash of an active moose. The instructions, encrypted by an American machine, were a series of lines of pathways made by a country through the machine, hidden inside an impressive key to hit the bomb. Guess the bomb, break the code, read the message, save the target. By 1939, these pathways were getting more complicated. British pilots, hard work by the police, frustrated by the changes to the In a race against the time, the communications arms race, a race to save lives, the number of pathways a key press could take to an Enigma machine was greater than the number of seconds since the universe. Yet Turing started down a path, a new approach to finding the single correct route among all the others, not working alone. One single among many. The work of engineers and cryptographers, without computers, with logic. To build and adapt a machine that would follow through the day's clues and discount Millions of impossible pathways, leading someone on a good day back to the instructions, the weather reports, and those few words that might save a ship, spare a city, hope that grows from original knowledge. Mm. Middle, which letters paired with B and R?
took me all day to work out what we mm. were. Yeah, but once they got it, yeah. that was it.
so often we have to clean up. GCHQ at Cheltenham do tours. Mm -hmm. Makes it got a custard cream. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's a cup. And there's a custard cream and a ball over there. Uh, yeah. They're not real. I know that. The water around it. <laughs> oh, custard cream, don't oh, yeah. I? Yep. Or a packet. Jamie Dodd, you know, they're honk checked in the middle. No doubt. Their officers have told them what they'll be facing. 
almost exact details of the defenses they're attacking and how they're going to beat them. But how do they know that? The answer lies a long way from the front line. But victory on that front line, in fact, victory in Europe, depends on it. in the south, a third Reich ruled. To them, the continent was Festum Europa, Fortress Europe. But that fortress was becoming increasingly besieged in the east by the Soviets and by the Western Allies in Italy. Along Europe's western coast, they had built a huge chain of defenses and fortifications to keep the Allies out, the Atlantic War. The beaches of Normandy were no exception. The soldiers heading for those beaches would need every advantage they could get if they were going to land successfully, if they were even going to survive. And most important of all would be accurate intelligence, because knowledge is power. The problem was that the Germans knew that too, so every message that mattered was encrypted to keep its content from falling into Allied hands. At first, German communications looked bulletproof, but there were chinks in the armor, and the Bletchley Park operation was specifically designed to get through them. Work at Bletchley Park had begun in 1938 with a handful of military and academic experts, but by 1944, thanks to people like Dilly Knox, John Tiltman, and later Max Newman and Bill Tutt, Bletchley Park had grown into the world's first intelligence factory. Almost 8,000 people were working here, three quarters of them women. Co-breakers like Gwen Watkins, Mavis Beatty, as well as machine operators, analysts, and communications staff. Bletchley Park may not have broken all, or even most of the enemy's signals, but every message showed a crucial part of the jigsaw. Break the SS encryption and you can read their signals. Match that with radio direction finding and you can pinpoint their headquarters. Break a message that shows paratroopers being moved from Italy to Brittany and you can deduce that a new airborne unit is being formed in northern France. Break a message about leave from a unit in Russia having to be approved by Field Marshal von Wunschler, and you can see that that unit is under his command, so it must be moving to the west. Now imagine that repeated thousands of times, with messages from the whole of Europe, all being examined, compared and coordinated by Eric Jones's team in Hub 3, turning it into useful intelligence about the German order of battle. And you can see how, in the year and a half before the invasion, Bletchley Park helped the Allies to create a detailed picture of Hitler's fortress Europe. Sometimes the enemy even did the work for them. Hitler was keen to show off his defences to his eastern allies, so he invited the Japanese ambassador, General Oshima, to tour the Atlantic War. In November 1943, Oshima sent a report home with full details of German defenses. With US help, Bletchley Park read the whole thing. In fact, by 1944, the Allies knew the exact location of every one of the 58 divisions in Hitler's Western Command, almost as well as the Germans themselves. The greatest prize of all was the communications network of the German High Command the messages between Germany's senior military commanders, Kesselring, von Rundstedt, Rommel, and the government in Berlin. In other words, a direct window into the minds of the German leadership. These messages, codenamed fish traffic, were protected with Lorenz machines, much more complex than Enigma. 
Enigma was good enough to disguise communications between ships or fighter squadrons. Lorenz had to hide the secrets of nations. Breaking into these high-level networks had tied up teams of bletchley Park cryptanalysts working painstakingly by hand. But help was on its way. That help came from those masters of electronic communication, the General Post Office, whose engineers turned Bill Tut's ideas on automated statistical analysis into a working machine, the Heath Robinson. But it was a team run by the brilliant Tommy Flowers who led that first machine's evolution into Bletchley Park's most sophisticated and reliable tool yet, Colossus. Colossus was a forerunner of today's technological world. The world's first large-scale electronic digital computer designed to automate code breaking, at least partly. Colossus performed millions of logical operations electronically to reveal the settings used to encipher an intercepted message. It was an amazing achievement, the result of nearly three years' hard work and invention. Now, the Allies could not only read more and more messages, messages that would once have been unbreakable, but they had access to some of the most valuable intelligence of the entire war, including direct communications between Hitler and his commander in the West, Field Marshal von Brunstedt. Bletchley Park had uncovered the scale of Hitler's megalomania, micromanagement, and paranoid distrust of his own commanders, allowing other branches of Allied intelligence to manipulate all of them, feeding the Germans the kind of intelligence they wanted to hear. Which set the stage for one of the great deceptions of all time, Operation Fortitude. The plan was to reinforce the Germans' belief that the Allies would invade, not in Normandy, but in the Pas de Calais, and it succeeded. From fake radio traffic detected by German eavesdroppers to fake reports from fake spies passed on by German double agents, they were fed a diet of deception, and they ate it up. It all supported the Germans' belief that Calais was the target. The team at Bletchley Park was ordered to monitor and analyze enemy communications and discover where the deception was working and where it needed reinforcement. Ten days before the planned invasion, Japanese General Oshima reported a dinner with Hitler, where the Fuhrer told him he was sure the invasion would be at Calais. With insights like these, Allied commanders could be more confident in their plans to invade Normandy. the thousands of troops about to storm ashore in the biggest amphibious invasion in history. It meant that they knew what they were facing. The access that Bletchley Park gave to enemy communications meant that Allied commanders could predict how the Germans might react and plan to counter them. American General Omar Bradley moved the 82nd Airborne Division's initial landing point after Hunt III revealed that new German troops would be waiting at the original drop zone. Once the invasion began, the speed of Enigma decryption was astounding. Messages were being intercepted, decrypted, translated, and ready to send on to Allied commanders in as little as two and a half hours. They were reading enemy reports of landing craft and paratroops almost as soon as the Germans themselves. But there were still gaps in what the Allies knew. And in any case, just knowing where the enemy was did not mean that they did not have to be fought. The combat was brutal. On D-Day alone, there were over 10,000 Allied and around 4,000 Axis casualties. But by the end of that day, about 156,000 men had landed in less than 24 hours. By the end of the 6th of June, they were leaving the beaches and forcing away inland. They would be followed by SLUs, Special Liaison Units, in each army headquarters, 
providing the life link to Bletchley Park for senior commanders. There will be hard fighting for months to come, all the way up to May of 1945, when Germany finally surrendered, bringing an end to six years of war in Europe. Between 1942 and VE Day, Bletchley Park had decoded around 5 million messages from Enigma, as well as other minor ciphers, and a volume of high-level cipher text, equivalent to over 120 paperback novels. Bletchley Park's work played a part in practically everything the Allies knew about German forces in Normandy. The Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force, General Eisenhower, wrote that the codebreakers had saved thousands of British and American lives. We know now that without intelligence developed here at Bletchley Park, our world would look very different. But for the Allied soldiers, sailors and airmen waiting to go into action in the early hours of the 6th of June 1944, victory still hung in the balance. And although they knew nothing of Bletchley Park, the work done here would help to tip that balance in their favour. So, that's the end of this video. I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, that's the end of Bletchley Park Part 2. Uh, there is no more parts at the minute. We explored everything. So, I hope you guys enjoyed. I'm going to be recording another video in a few days time when this is coming out so I'm trying to wrap this up quick enough so I can render the video so then I can go to bed so then I can wake up really really early for a video so I'm sorry but I'm gonna have to leave you see you in the next video peace